All right. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Let's get this projecting for you. Here we go. All right. So, um, as you know, homework two is posted. That'll be due on Tuesday. We will go over that um, together along with homework one. Um, answer any other questions you have about our first exam, which will be a week from today. And um, so any questions, we'll go through those. We'll go through the, the homework problems, talk a little bit about those. And then kind of anything else you have um, exam-wise, we'll, we'll talk about. I will also post a quiz type thing, a quiz participation assignment for Tuesday. Um, again, those those should just take five to ten minutes, so I don't uh, I don't want to burden you with those, and I don't suspect they will be a, too much of a burden. But just keep you on pace with some of the more subjective matter that I don't want to put it on an exam because I want to test your abilities for technical, you know, applied technical skills for the exams. But I want you to know something about water treatment more generally. So um, that's that's the plan. Um, Last time we were talking about, yeah, question? Uh, yeah, what did you say was due um, a week from today? Um, we'll have an exam a week from today, our first exam. Okay. Yeah. And the, the homework will be due on Tuesday before we start class. Yeah. Oh, Noodle, it said it's on the 29th. 29th? Yeah. Oops. Um, well, I guess I'm going faster than I meant to. So I'll, I'm going to keep with the, the syllabus. Um, since we're, we are where we are, I will, I will have Tuesday as an exam review day. We'll have the homework due then. Um, what I'll do is I'll start kind of the intro to water treatment in general next Thursday. We're going to keep to the syllabus schedule, so don't mind me. Um, I only know what I'm talking about when I actually look at my syllabus. <laughs> So thank you, um, and I apologize for the confusion. So this does mean I think we're ahead enough, so we'll, we'll probably not um, not have class that Tuesday before Thanksgiving, um, unless we have more hurricanes or something. So that's that's the track that I'm. Um, I think we're on, so that's good. Yeah, whatever the syllabus says is what it's going to be, and that should should be the 29th. Okay, so appreciate that clarification. I'll, I'll send an email as well for anybody that missed it. Okay, so last time we talked about um, particle stability. We were talking about coagulation. I wanted to just make a couple notes about those slides from last time. I added a couple slides and did a couple corrections. Um, this slide here, uh, just another schematic of what it looks like for that electrical double layer. I'm going to talk about them in our current slide set, um, but I just wanted to let you know I, I added both, both of these to, um, to this set of slides that I posted. I also went through and corrected and filled in the solutions to the problems for uh, the ionic strength uh, examples. So again, I would encourage you to go through and make sure you can do this without the, um, without the solutions here. I expect you to be able to do these ionic strength equations. I give you this ionic strength, um, yeah, the equation, the formula for it. Um, but you do need to know when we have two sources of chloride, for example, we're getting one combined concentration of chloride that we use for the ionic strength equation. So just brush up on your chemistry if you need to. Um, these two are good examples. And I, I went through and filled them out. Um, it was nice. I, I actually, so I had my bigger screen in front of me so I could actually write um, a little bit more concisely um, for that. Okay, so that was, just wanted to let you know that's up there. Um, slides we're going to go through today are here. Okay, so I talked about, I mentioned that I added this slide in the next one. Uh, essentially what we're looking at is a fancier drawing of what I was talking about, where we have some solid surface 
it has a net negative charge um, on it. You could imagine these little um, kind of negative charge at the surface. And then what's physically experienced by other stuff in the water is the fact that it positive ions, so cations, get really close and um, you know, come to satisfy that charge. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> then a set of negative ions, so anions, come uh, and interact with that positive layer. And it gives us a double layer which extends the effect of the surface charge out into solution. And depending on the distance here, that's usually what causes repulsion and causes particles to be stable towards uh, stable, com you know, in, in the sense where they're not going to combine with other particles. <coughs> this other slide is showing this effect in practice. So in, in both of these cases, so in all, all of these cases here, we, what we're looking at is what's happening as a function of adding charge or adding concentration of some salt. So I'm going to start up here on the top left. What we're looking at is um, this potential here that, that's really surface charge. So that's kind of the, the surface charge and how far we're detecting that surface charge distance in nanometers away from the surface. So if we look at that previous one, we're, we're really detecting the, the distance with which we can find that charge. So this is that distance in the next slide. Um, and so we're, we're checking and we see 10, 20, 30, 40 nanometers. And this, uh, this potential, that's, you know, we're, we're detecting some amount of charge and the further away we go, the less charge we, we sense. Um, so that's just what it's showing there. If you were to say, you know, at 40 millivolts, we'll just check what happens there. Then you can see these different lines. Um, with 60 milligrams per liter of sodium chloride, uh, table salt, we go out and we have about 15 nanometers into solution. Now if we add 10 times that amount, 600, that same line brings us to something more along the lines of six or seven nanometers. Uh, multiply that by 100 again, have 6,000 milligrams per liter of sodium chloride, and we go out to just a couple nanometers. That's for sure getting to the point where um, that electrical double layer is small enough it's short enough where other forces are going to start taking um, taking charge. If you consider the the amount of salt in the ocean, that's usually between 20 and 30 grams per liter, um, maybe as low as 5 grams per liter in Lake Pontchartrain, something like that, where you've got brackish water. Um, and it, so here with 6 grams per liter, we see that that we're getting to the point where we're going to destabilize particles, most likely, or you know we can see that we're getting more and more compressed. And this is actually the reason if you go out into the open ocean, the water's going to be clear, at least in terms of particles. It might be some color, but it will be more clear because most of the particles that, you know, the sediment particles, things like that, if you look out what happens when the Mississippi goes out into the Gulf, it's essentially causing a bunch of sedimentation. So you get all that sediment dropping out of solution. Um, because these particles are being destabilized by this, by this ionic strength effect. Another way you can look at it um, is instead of changing the amount of salt we're adding, change the charge on the species. So in our ionic strength equation, we had Z is the, the charge of, of a given ion. So if we have one minus here or one plus, um, this is what it looks like at a given amount of salt we add. We change that to an a two plus, and we see even with the same amount of, you know, the same molar amount of salt, we have a much, um, a much shorter distance for that charge into solution, and three plus likewise. Okay, so then this last figure here I wanted to talk about. This is the residual turbidity. So turbidity is a count of how many particles are in solution. How how much light's being scattered by these particles that are floating around stable in solution. So if at 100% turbidity uh, remaining, that means however much, however muddy it was, if it stays at 100%, then it, it's still 
just as muddy. So if we look, let's take our sodium example. We're adding sodium something. Um, so we're really just interested in the effect of sodium here. How much sodium does it take before we get that turbidity to go from 100% to zero? Because that means we have like zero percent turbidity you know, compared to what we started with. That means there's all the particles have sedimented out. Okay, so this is that coagulation effect that we're looking for. Well, if we're adding here the dose, and this is on a log scale, um, we're at 100% and we keep going, going, going until we hit this point with the sodium. And that's, you know, something like 9,000 milligrams per liter, we start having that effect. And then by 10,000, we have pretty much complete removal. Compare that to calcium with 2 plus, uh, several orders of magnitude lower as needed. So the, the calcium is just just based on changing that charge is a huge difference. And then aluminum as well. Uh, and you can becomes very clear why alum, so Al2SO4, is very commonly used um, because of the, the high, high amount of charged species there. If we were to use sodium chloride, well, first of all, it's very hard to diff it's very difficult to remove sodium and chloride from solution, but it but it's also going to require a whole lot of it compared to what how much aluminum sulfate we need to add. Um, turns out that we can also precipitate aluminum very easily. We don't have anything like that for sodium and chloride. Turbidity, Turbidity is the a particle count. Um, we'll talk about this a bit in more depth when we get to filtration, but turbidity is really um, a, a count of the amount of particles. And usually the way we measure it is particles scattering light. And so when you, when you look at muddy water, and you're, or if you've ever um, heard about the visibility through the water is, you know, one foot or something in, a, in some dirty water, that means that, that gives us some indication of how turbid it is, the uh, amount of light that's being scattered. If you can see 10 feet in, uh, there's not a lot of light being scattered, but some light, um, whereas, you know, crystal clear water, you could see, you know, very, very far through. <clears throat> okay, so I wanted to add that to, to last time's discussion. I had intended to include these in those slides in the first place. Okay. So with that, um, I'm going to come back to the flocculation, which is what we'll uh, probably finish with today. We've got an example problem. So flocculation, we're forming what we call flocks, and these flocks are um, essentially going to be larger particles. They, we assume that they're made up of the original particles. So if we have one initial particle, or let's say uh, three of them, a flock consisting of three particles will look something like that. And we're going to assume that the particles are going to retain their initial volume, all that sort of stuff. So by reducing the number of particles floating around, because in this case we have three versus one, by reducing that n, the, the number concentration over time, we're making these larger particles. And we know by the settling equation for the settling velocity that larger particles, the bigger diameter, are going to have um, a faster settling velocity. Okay, and there's a little graphic here demonstrating some turbid water, um, flocculation occurred or is occurring and some sedimentation is happening, and then you see that sedimentation. So pretty good uh, display also of, of turbidity here. Okay, so then mathematically we're interested in understanding how quickly is this going to happen, how big are the particles going to be once we're we're done with the flocculation process, and how can we how can we deal with all that? So the first thing would be mixing conditions. As you think about it, you know how much mixing is going to happen, and essentially what we're going to do today is build um, build to understanding. A, an equation, we'll get to this in a minute, but dn dt equals 
negative kn. This will be our first order decay equation for the number, the number of um, uh, particles in solution. And this k here is what we're going to get at from, you know, mixing conditions will apply to that as well as some other parameters. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to that, but I just wanted to let you know that's, that's kind of where we're heading. So mixing intensity then, we can describe if we, before looking at the equations and stuff, what we can do is let's say we have a surface and this could be the, the wall of a reactor, um, the side of a, a bottle when we're swirling some water around in it, or it can be maybe a paddle wheel as we are pushing it through the water to cause stirring. Um, if we look at the way our velocity changes as a function of distance away from come on, as a function of distance away from the surface. All right then. We'll just deal with it. We can imagine that our our velocity, the velocity of the water, when it reaches the surface, we actually know it's pretty much going to zero. Um, just from drag forces and such. And so as we get further and further away from the surface, our velocity term is increasing. And we can look at this gradient and see that the mixing intensity we can define as how these velocity terms are changing as a function of distance and we can look at that slope and get our mixing gradient. So if this is distance in y here away from the surface, then we can look at the slope where we have dv, so the difference in velocity, over dy per distance away from the surface. This is effectively what g means. Okay, so conceptually what we're looking at is if you were to take a, um, a propeller spinning through the water and you spin it slowly, the, the water right next to that propeller or whatever blade you're using is going to be, um, you know, it'll have a, a relatively um, slow change. Right? There's, there's not going to be a huge change in velocity the further away you go. It's moving through nice and slowly. Whereas if you have a, it spinning very fast and going very quickly through solution, as soon as you get a little bit far away from the, the blade, you've got a huge differential in, in the velocity. Okay, so that's kind of makes sense conceptually, I hope. Um, we don't have to worry too much about um, derivations here that's I just wanted to let you know that's where it's coming from the slope here um, our equation is going to be uh, that we're going to use for the class is going to be this one over here where this mixing intensity is equal to the square root of the power added to the system um, by whatever mixing thing we're using divided by the dynamic viscosity and the volume of that chamber or basin <coughs> that we're working in and these units are going to be in per seconds. So if you were to um, use power in watts and you know take a look at all the, the units, this will work out to give you units in per second. Okay, and that's, that's important because as we start thinking about how we're making our K up here, ultimately it's going to be in per seconds because we know it's first order. We know it depends on the number of particles in there. You know, how often particles are going to collide with each other should depend on how many particles are in there. So that, that's effectively going to be giving us our units there. Okay, mu we've seen, that's the dynamic viscosity of water. Vol Vb here is the volume of the chamber. Okay, so uh, in terms of calculating these collision reactions, I mentioned already we're doing dndt. That's, that's kind of our, our goal here. And when we do that, we're going to say that dndt is equal to negative kn. We've seen this before. 
Um, you know, we've already already kind of covered the core basics of, of this process. And in this case, what we're looking at is how do we get k? And just a note here that this is going to be first order decay. As n decreases, the size of the aggregates is going to increase. Kind of showed this once already, but let's say we have in some volume here nine particles. Well, let's make it ten. Then when we do the flocculation, and let's say then we end up with one particle that's made up of ten early ones. Maybe that's not the right way to do it. So let's say that's 10. I kind of lost track because PowerPoint was not behaving well. So then we have the one particle. We're assuming this is just one new particle here, one aggregate. And we can take a look and we say, all right, in this volume, whatever I drew here, we had 10 particles per, we're going to call that a liter. It's probably, maybe, maybe we'll just call it a milliliter. That feels more right. Then we end up getting, at the final, um, n then is one particle per milliliter. And we can write this out particle if we want to. And so this here would be n naught, our initial. This is, the again, the number concentration. So what we're starting with is some initial number of particles per volume. Now you you could calculate, let's say, let's say I give you a problem where you have a 10 cubic meter tank and you have initial, you know, some initial value of particles for every liter. You could count the total number of particles in the whole basin, um, but it's just going to make more sense to work with concentrations instead of complete numbers of particles. So just keep in mind n and n naught, these are per volume concentrations, right? These are number concentrations. Okay, so when we do this comparison here, our process, our flocculation process, took us from 10 particles per milliliter to one particle per milliliter. We can write this out as um, yeah, n equals 10, n naught equals one. So this is parts per milliliter. And then if we express this as n over n naught, that would be 10. And this is this is giving us 10. Oh, excuse me, I wrote that backwards. So n is 1, because that was the final number, and n naught was 10. Um, that was the initial number. Okay, so then if we do n over n naught, then that should be 1 over 10. That ratio. That's the ratio of final to initial particles. Um, something that might be more helpful is actually to write instead n naught over n. This one is equal to 10. And this is the number of particles of original particles. So I'll say initial particles in each aggregate. Okay. So you're going to end up needing to use this. You've probably seen this on the homework already. Um, but this concept here of a way to express how many particles there are in these new aggregates, this ends up being very useful. You've seen how we derive equations already. You've seen there we have ways to solve for n equals n naught. You know, it depends on the, the form of the mass balance. But you've seen us already solve things like this where it's easy to, to arrange for n over n naught or n naught over n. Um, you've seen that type of equation. So I wanted to remind you here that there's an important step of converting from this concept um, 
for the word problems, you'll have you'll be asked or given some concept about the number of particles, and we'll use that. So we'll, we'll use it in, in an example in a couple minutes, but that becomes important in order you know, to keep in mind as we as we solve these. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's move on and define k. So this rate constant that we're interested in, uh, we have a formula here. So k equals this alpha for omega g divided by pi. And again, this should be in per time units at the end of the day. So this equation here, we see the mixing intensity. So g here, and we already know g is in per seconds. So everything else unit-wise should cancel out or be uh, unitless. So then we have this alpha term and this omega term that we're not familiar with. So those are the next two we're going to tackle. Um, this guy is the collision efficiency. And that's a ratio or a fraction telling us how, you know, given some number of collisions that happen, particles collide with another particle, they get close enough to interact. Given, let's say, 10 collisions, how many of those become a new, a new uh, combined particle? And so if our collision efficiency is one, that means we, every time the particles collide, they stick together. So the collision efficiency then is 100%. We're expressing it as an, a fraction here. Um, so we're leaving that as 1.0. So alternately, if it's all the way down at zero, that means every time they collide, they bounce back apart. They're completely stable. Um, so another way to describe this would be completely stable. This is kind of indicating that the electrostatic forces are strong enough to push them apart, never allowing them to get close enough to allow the attractive forces to dominate that force balance. We could have it somewhere in between. Fairly often we'll be solving problems where the collision efficiency is one, um, but we could certainly uh, change that or solve for a case where we don't know the collision efficiency, but we know the other parameters of the problem. Okay, so keeping, you know, with that in mind, if you ever are solving for it, we know that the collision efficiency is going to be between zero and one. Um, a fraction can't be anything else. Um, we can't have, you know, less than zero percent of particles, you know, creating new aggregates. Okay, so that's, that's one number. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of times it'll just be given, might have you solve for it, um, but it's uh, not too complicated, and since it's a fraction, it is unitless. Okay, so that leaves us with one unitless thing, uh, number four times omega here. We already know g is in per seconds, all divided by pi, which is, we know that 3.14, it's unitless. So that means this last term should also be unitless. And turns out it is, although it's maybe not directly intuitive at first. So we call this term the flock volume. Really what this is, is the flock volume of a, in a given volume. Okay, so given some volume, some volume of water, we measure the volume of that water that is taken up by these flocks. Okay? Um, since we assume that the diameter of the particles, the initial particles, which usually we're given some information about the, uh, the particle size to begin with, um, we will assume dp is conserved when we form aggregates. So um, if we have that n naught over n, like we talked about earlier, is 10. Uh, what, 
what I'll say is if this is the case, then um, the volume of an aggregate is going to be equal to 10 times the volume of the particle, right? Um, just because literally we're assuming each of the initial particles creates 10 new ones, we're not adding any volume there, we're just sticking them all together and calling it a new particle, okay? So that's, that's just um, kind of a basic assumption there. So one aggregate equals 10 of those if that n naught over n equals one. That gives us a way to, um, you know, and we'll see this in a, a problem in a minute, that gives us a way to kind of compare, uh, you know, what's the new volume going to be, what's the new size of particles going to be if we have X number of new particles. Okay, coming back to this flock volume thing then, we can actually calculate if we have a certain number of particles per volume and we can calculate the volume of those particles, then we know this flock volume. Doesn't matter how many how many aggregates we made, doesn't matter any about that. We can just use the original dp for this calculation if we also have the original the the n naught. Okay? So what we're going to see in this equation then is really just the volume of a sphere. So pi times the diameter divided by 6, so diameter cubed divided by 6. That's going to be our diameter of the sphere, and then we're going to multiply that by the number of spheres per volume. Okay, so normally this would give us, you know, cubic meters or some volume term with the uh, diameter here. So th this would be volume, and then we're multiplying it by a number per volume because that's what n naught is. Okay, so what we see here is this is a volume per volume, meaning that our pi dp cubed over six, that's a volume, and our n naught is a number per volume. So we're left with just a number once we divide by the volumes in terms of units. And just a simple number is gonna be unitless technically. So ultimately this is becoming unitless um, even though we're calling it a flock volume. Okay, so one thing I want to point out here is typically we're going to have the diameter in some sort of meter units and the n term typically in milliliters or liters. So make sure to convert and get everything in the same, the same unit. Um, let's see. I'll just write a little note to convert units. Um, usually what I'll do is dp to meters and n not to number per cubic meter. Obviously you can you can decide how you want. You can do uh, whichever one you want to do here. Um, you could do it in centimeters, um, whatever you like, that's fine. Uh, just make sure you do that so that it actually is unitless instead of like milliliters per cubic meter or something like that. Okay, with all of that, we see that our uh, rate constant then, we have some constant here that's probably given times four times this flock volume, which is Unitless, just kind of the amount of the amount of space in a given volume of water that's occupied by particles instead of water times this mixing intensity divided by pi. Okay, so that's, what that's doing for us is really giving us the uh, that rate at which particles are going to be combining to form new particles. So it's not just the collision efficiency, but it's also including um, how many particles are in the solution by volume and how intensely mixed the system is going to be. Um, looking at this just by itself, you can see that if you just increase G quite a bit, mix it more and more and more, stronger and stronger, 
this equation just says that it's going to have faster collision, you know, a faster rate of aggregation. Well, in reality, if you get it too high, it's going to break them apart. This equation doesn't account for that. Um, just kind of a side note there. So it, we'll, we'll keep G within some reasonable uh, framework. Otherwise, we'd be, we'd give it a reason to, um, the aggregates to split apart again. Okay. Um, yeah, so just kind of the same thing I meant to, uh, I guess I have this slide twice and I added here um, for the number and not, this is again the number of particles, number of original particles per volume and dp is a diameter, um, like we said. All right. So on to an example. This is example 6.2 in the book. Um, we have silt flocculation before sedimentation. So I think it was example 6.1, we talked about sedimentation. We didn't remove all the silt. And so this one's kind of following up in that, that idea um, where we have 0 0.01 millimeter silt particles. Uh, they're completely destabilized by adding alum. That's the aluminum sulfate we talked about. Uh, it's passed through one of two side-by-side well-mixed flocculation chambers. The chambers are cubic, with each dimension being three and a half meters. They are mixed with paddle mixers that input two and a half kilowatts of power uh, into the water in each chamber. The water entering the flocculation chamber contains 10 to the fifth particles per milliliter. And then we're asked, what is the average diameter of the aggregates leaving the flocculation chamber? Now, we're going to assume that the new aggregates, these are also spherical. It doesn't really make perfect sense because you can't make a sphere out of individual spheres, but we're going to pretend we can. Um, once they merge, they retain exactly the same volume, but create a sphere. That's kind of our assumption. Okay, a couple things here. First of all, we've got a couple conversions for you. I went ahead and wrote out the dynamic viscosity of water for you, so you um, kind of from the last problem. Um, so we have all the info here you need. What I would recommend you do first thing is to go ahead and draw it out. Okay, so I'll give you some time. We'll work through it together, but definitely draw this schematic out so that you can understand what exactly um, we're talking about when it says, you know, when, when we're looking at this system. So I'll give you some time and then we'll, I'll solve it with you on this next, next slide here.
So hopefully you guys had the, uh, you drew it out something like this. You could see that each each reactor, they're gonna be identical. One has 1.5 milligram, uh, excuse me, MGD. Um, both of them have that. And we can convert, that becomes, so if we do the MGD conversion, 1.5, so Q equals 1.5 MGD. That's going to equal, if we convert that to cubic meters per second, that's going to be 0 0.0657 cubic meters per second through one of the reactors. Um, so just wanted to make sure you got that far. I'm going to go ahead and go over to the next spot and start setting up some more of the problem. So continue working. Um, and again, feel free to ask each other or ask me questions if, if you have any. Okay, so if you didn't already, you're going to need G. Uh, I went ahead and solved that. It's pretty straightforward. You need to convert to watts instead of kilowatts. And you need to get your volume from the uh, cubic reactors, 3.5 meters on each side. So 3.5 cubed is 42.875. Okay, so as you start thinking about how to solve for the diameter, so the average diameter of the aggregate. I'll just leave it as dag. Um, so that's our question. Talked about it earlier um, and noted that we need some sort of relation um, between n and n naught, right? So need n naught over n or something like that to compare because um, if we can find that then we can compare the number in each and then can then go back, use the volume of the sphere, stuff like that, um, to solve. So that's uh, that's where I would take the next step is looking for an equation for that. We can assume that this is a CSTR because it's well mixed, flowing through that that uh, well mixed reactor. So we need to set up a mass balance that'll satisfy a CSTR for a first order decay reaction. We can also assume that this is steady state. We're giving, given no information about uh, any anything changing in the system that would 
make us pause otherwise. go ahead and organ reorganize this this equation for n and n naught um, and then what we'll end up finding is we need k so we have a little more to do to solve for k um, so I'm just gonna work on this step by step you probably you may be further along already um, so I'm talking it out so you can kind of if you were getting stuck somewhere hopefully you can uh, progress from there So I just solved for the uh, flock volume here, converted the um, particle diameter, which was given as 0.01 millimeter, converted that to meters, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 5th meters, cubed that entire volume, entire um, amount to get the um, diameter cubed in, in cubic meters, multiplied that by the n naught here, that was given to us as the 10 to the fifth particles per milliliter. Had to convert that to meters, so converted that by multiplying 10 to the sixth milliliters per cubic meter. Um, 
You could have gone to liters and then converted milliliters to liters. That'd be fine too, because it's 10 to the third or 1,000 liters per cubic meter. Um, so from there, uh, just divide by six, we get 5.24 times 10 to the minus fifth. So that's one of the more involved um, unit conversion steps. So make sure you you check out what's happening there so that we get everything in, in meters. Okay, from there we can plug in numbers and get our n naught over n. apologize to, to you guys in the class. I have a border right about here and here, where for the people viewing online, that's all cut off to be my, my little head, you know, the video feed. So I'm trying not to, to write over that space. Um, that's why it's looking funny here. So we do that, uh, we can get our answer here in terms of n naught over n. And if we put in all the numbers, if I wrote it all up correctly, this should end up giving us a, a number of 10.8 of the original particles for every final particle. Um, so that that's our partial answer. We can go from there to get our the actual answer. Right, so from here, we need to do a comparison. Um, the, the volume, that volume comparison I mentioned a minute ago, I don't quite have enough room, so I'm going to pull up a... Pull up a scratch pad for a moment. I'll put this into the um, PowerPoint when I'm done. So we were just looking at um, okay. this is unfortunate. I can't see my uh, cursor through through my screen like I can on the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. So we want to know the volume of each aggregate. This is this is going to be difficult. Um, And we know that this is going to be equal to pi pi over 6 times the diameter of the aggregate. I'm just going to do it this way. Pi over 6 times the diameter cubed. Um, for the That's going to be the volume of the aggregate. Okay. Um, now, if we compare that to the volume of the particle, we know this is going to be pi over 6 times the diameter of the particle cubed. So the, the thing here is we can calculate the volume of the particles, the initial particles, because we have information on them. And we need to end up solving for the volume of the aggregate. Um, if, we, if we substitute, um, we know that essentially the, the volumes, the total volumes are going to be the same, right? Because uh, so what, what we're interested in doing is solving for the, the new diameter. We have the initial diameter. We also know that the volumes are the same. Um, so what we can do here is we can say that um, effectively 
the volume of the aggregate is also equal to the 10.8 you know, times the volume of the initial particle. So that's going to be 10.8 times pi over 6 dp cubed. All right, so that's that's what we can do um, if we set set up our equation that way. Then we can solve for um, the volume of the aggregate, and then go back to find the diameter of the aggregate afterwards. Okay, so then from here we can say, um, well, just a little bit of algebra, and if you do that, you'll you can end up solving for the diameter as 0 0.0221 millimeters. And if you remember, our the diameter of the particle was 0 0.01 millimeters. Okay, so that gives us a comparison. The size basically doubled um, <coughs> when we sent it through that flocculation problem. Again, I'll add this to the, the tail end of the slides um, before I post those. Um, but ultimately, the diameter of the aggregate was 0 0.0221 millimeters. Okay, so that's our answer. And from there, we can kind of tell, you know, if we wanted to, we could solve that 6.1 problem again just using this new diameter to tell us um, how exactly did the, the settling velocity change when we increased, we did this flocculation and increased, um, increased their size based on that process. Okay, so then we could, you know, do some, you know, if we wanted to, we could do that again and say, okay, well now do all the particles, are all the particles removed or how, what percentage of them? And maybe we could say, all right, yes, maybe 98% of them were removed, how do we get 100%? Something like that. There's, there's more problems we could do from there. I'm not gonna sequence in the exam all of these together. I will keep them at least a little bit separate for, um, for the sake of being reasonable. You know, not trying not to count the, the one right answer at the very beginning means, you know, one wrong answer at the beginning means you get everything else wrong. That's not what I wanna do. All right. Um, so one other thing I wanted to mention here, and this is this is something we see on the homework. Oops. Um, we have a problem on the homework, and uh, sorry, just a moment. The problem gives us a a series of um, flocculation chambers, and I just wanted to mention that there's something else we can do with a series like this. Um, in terms of mass balances. This will come up occasionally and I wanted to go ahead and introduce it because I have a couple minutes and I'm thinking about it. But if we had three different um, flocculation chambers here, all mi mixing and giving us um, this flocculation process, well you can look at it as, you know, we've got the Q, we've got this N naught, um, and then we have N1, N2, and N3. This is not specific to flocculation, just using that as an example, but just expanding on our, our uh, use of mass balances. Because uh, occasionally I'll give problems that are along these lines uh, for homeworks and exams. So, you know, it, I think in our homework problem, we're dealing just with this first one. Um, well, we, we do have some calculations, but in terms of mass balances, I think we're just dealing with this first one. Um, but something we could do is say, okay, well, we know we can solve for n naught over n1, but then what happens if we want to know something about n3? Um, and to solve for n3, what we what we can do, um, really what, what we need to do is see, say that, okay, n1's gonna go into this process, so we have to account for that process. And then that'll give us n2, which goes through another process to get n3. And the point I want to make here is you can combine these processes to get kind of a final um, end result. A lot of times all you need to do is just multiply. Um, 
because if you multiply this by n1 over n2, that's what happens here, right? That's, you know, we can solve a mass balance, set up a mass balance and solve it for this second reactor and have, um, and have some sort of, oops, some sort of a equation here that describes the process from n1 to n2. That's exactly what we were doing. I mean, just now we had a system we solved for n0 over n. Um, that's just the same as doing n0 over n1. So given that we solve for these types of equations, if we do this in a series this way, we could then have n3 um, over n2. And if we set it up this way, then, um, excuse me, I messed that up. That should be a and two here and one there because um, it's the final over initial if we're writing it this way I did this all backwards didn't I um, Pardon me just this moment. Okay, so sometimes we might be solving the other way around, n over n naught. You know, we, we looked at that before. It, this same process, we can do it either way, right? So if we were looking at n over n naught, that would be, um, gosh. Let me, let me rewrite this and start over. It, it really doesn't matter too much which way we're doing it, but we can, we can do it either way. So. In a lot of systems, we're looking at the n final, so in this case n1 over n naught. We can multiply that by the final for the second one over the initial for the second one, and that by the final for the third one divided by the initial for the th third one. Alternately, we could also look at it the other way around, like we do sometimes for flocculation, the initial divided by that final and do that for each one of these reactors. And what we'll see just, um, just looking at it this way, we can cancel the N1s and the N2s, and we're left with just N3 over N0. Now, keep in mind that we have some equation that you know, if we're multiplying these together this way, we can take the entire mass balance equation, you know, whatever solution we had for it. Um, you know, in our, in our last example, that was um, the net equation was um, 1 plus k theta, right? So we had 1 plus k theta. And this time I'll say theta 1. We'll have theta 1, theta 2. And if these are identical, these would be the same. But what this would translate to is multiplying across that term by the next one, 1 plus k theta 2, and the next one, right? So I'm just kind of demonstrating that we can take these mass balances and carry them over to a, to a system of, of um, reactors if we wanted to. The same, the same type of deal happens if we just inverted everything. And we can cancel the N1s, cancel the N2s, and we're left with just N0 over N3. That's just inverting it, and you know, we would we'd get the inversion. I think, actually, this is probably the, the version. These probably all apply down here, actually. Would look a little different inverted. It's probably one over that for, um, for these guys. But my point, my point stands that this is the um, this is an approach we can take um, to sequence them to know what happens if you go through multiple steps. Okay, um, here we're kind of assuming that the k is staying the same for all of them, but you could, in theory, just say k one, k two, k three, and solve it that way. Now, if you had just everything identical, then you can actually just take this thing, you know, this one plus k theta. And just cube it. If you had three identical reactors, everything's the same. You can just cube that term, and that's your solution. So just kind of wanted to show that um, 
that way to think about these reactors, uh, kind of adding a little bit of extra, an extra tool for you to use for mass balances. Does that make sense? Okay, so the question was, um, for those of you online, on the homework problem, we've got tapered flocculation basins, and is that this style, or is it that style we, we looked at earlier today in the example where it had the parallel? Um, so I don't remember exactly how it phrased it in the uh, homework, but it, it is this style where we have a sequence, a sequential one. Um, the one we looked at in the example today, that was, they were doing in parallel. And so if we were to compare this to a parallel case, we're splitting the flow in half or in thirds or whatever, um, but the uh, you know the particles that they're seeing are the same. So again, I, I just it was a great question. I'd always recommend um, drawing it out because here for the initial, even if we have let's say a different volume, uh, and we're gonna say this is v1 and this is v2, maybe something different happening in them. What we're going to end with, so this would be N1 then, and this would be N2, but the N naught is feeding them both, right? Um, so that's, that's what I would point out is uh, in the sequential or the in series versus in parallel, you're going to have a difference there. Um, and so in the example we solved today, it was just a matter of just splitting it in half, and we know what happens in the one, and they're identical, so that's going to be the same thing happening in the other. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Why is it So that was our that was our solution from our problem today. Um, if we take a look at what we were deriving, so the question was why is it one plus k theta? That was our solution when we solved our mass balance for n naught over n, which is why I went ahead and um, drew this arrow here because really I was, that was the solution for the n naught over n1 type of, type of equation. So that comes from our initial mass balance. We have zero accumulation because we assume steady state. Um, we have what's coming into the reactor here as qn naught minus what's going out, qn. We could write this qn1, right? Um, just going to leave it off now to keep it simple. Um, then that's plus the reaction term, which happens to be negative K and V. Uh, so when we, when I process this from here, I subtracted QN not from both sides. So I had negative QN equals negative QN, excuse me, negative QN not minus equals negative QN minus K and V. So I just took the negative out of all sides there. Um, and so we, then we had QN not equals QN plus K V N. So that's why it turned out to have that plus there. Now, what you'll notice here is if we had a growth equation instead, it was going to most likely be a, a negative there. So again, I could ask you a growth rate equation for some other problem. Flocculation is always going to be a decay rate because we're always going to be reducing the number of particles. But that, that's a good question and a good reminder of why, it, why we need to at least be aware of what's happening in the mass balance. Um, to get us there. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. I just want to be clear on how we got VA from N naught over N. Yeah. So how did we get um, DA from N naught over N? That was what we worked over here. When we, we relate the volume of the aggregate to the diameter of the aggregate, we have that equation and we can relate the volumes um, directly. So the, the total volume um, doesn't change the, of, of the particles versus the um, aggregates. So 10.8 times the volume of one particle should equal one times the diameter of one aggregate. Because we make that assumption that the volume is conserved 
And so that relationship, um, and I apologize, I wasn't very clear when I was stating that. This relationship here is based on that volume conservation that lets us put our the volume of the aggregate in terms of the diameter of the initial particles. Um, so then we can get the volume term of one, one aggregate, which lets us go back and solve for the diameter of one aggregate. Good question. Yeah. Um, on that example, how do we, we just assume the output is equal to one? Yeah, good question. So the, we were so we were asked um, how do we know alpha? So I, I wrote it here and essentially where where I got that from was the first sentence in the problem. Sorry, I'm gonna try to erase that. Um, in the right up here, really easy to miss, it says all the silt particles from that previous example are completely destabilized. So that's what tips us off that this is a, that should be set to one. Good questions. Anything else? Anyone online? Nobody, nobody's chatting online today. They're all watching Netflix. You guys are the responsible ones. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, question. Okay. Yeah, so the question is how do we get the drawing from the problem? Okay, so let's let's take a quick look again. Um, it says we've got this water, it's destabilized, it's passed through one of two side-by-side -side well mixed flocculation chambers. So um, the fact that it's side by side, um, it it's not very clear the way they worded it, but it's what it's meaning is they're parallel like this. So um, the flow, it, it says we have three, three MGD from the last problem. And it's saying after it, it's dosed with a coagulant, the water is going to pass through one, one or the other, really, um, one of two side-by-side -side reactors. So it's, it's hinting at the fact that it's splitting into two streams and going through these two reactors. Um, and it doesn't tell us anything about you know adding more more to one or the other it just makes that statement and that's that's kind of an assumption we have to make um, if you had a question on an exam like that you'd, I'd be well welcome you to ask me if it wasn't clear um, and if if I feel it like it's fair I'll certainly be happy to help and you know sometimes if, especially if I'm designing a new problem sometimes I'll I'll just make a straight up make a mistake on the wording and then I'll just clarify for the entire class. Um, so never never feel like you can't ask. All right, well if there's nothing else, we'll call it a day, we'll go over the homeworks next time. And again, the exam's on the 20, what do we say? Check the syllabus, I'll, I'll make an announcement. <laughs> we'll, we'll go by the syllabus. All right, have a good weekend.